All right. Awesome. Let's go to our beginning, beginning screen. Aloha, Dr. Glenn Swart out here. I'm going to share a new set of slides, briefly introducing what I'll be using tomorrow uh, at Health Experts Alliance, HEA, uh, leading the clinical call. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, there we go. We start with the first slide where I can just uh, be on screen and, and speak directly to the audience. And uh, then we'll move into the slides here. So first one is just an introductory slide. Accelerate self-healing with photoenergetic regulatory medicine because everything is ultimately light. You're going to hear a little bit about that in, in this presentation. And what we find when we work with photoenergetic regulatory medicine, which uh, is what I call the medicine of the future, uh, <clears throat> we find that we can reverse about a year of damage in one month. That's a year of aging and degeneration. So we've become nature deficient, particularly in the last 150 years. Uh, the further we get from the natural environments, the natural stimuli, natural influences that our organism is designed for, uh, <clears throat> designed to heal with, the more we become deficient. Every stress that we encounter can be healed with an appropriate access to the, the, the proper healing stimuli, the, the nutrients, the and, uh, quantum energies, the information, the access to uh, the epigenetic field to turn on healthy genes, turn off disease genes. So every impact has a specific effect on our needs for specific healing from the natural world that we are so removed from. So traumas can be reversed. We're seeing reversal of scar tissue in the eye and brain that, that we're, doctors are still learning in school, like I did when I was in school. There's irreversible damage. No, it's not irreversible damage. So the first time that I saw that damage reverse 35 years ago, based on the information that I had from research and com had compiled uh, and then applying in, in clinical cases, seeing blindness from wet macular degeneration reverse in a few months, regaining eye health, stopping the bleeding, reducing the scar tissue in the retina and restoring functional vision. So we don't even know what's possible, but we can only find out by trying. And uh, we have to try what the, asking the body what it needs to heal, what it wants to heal, in what sequence, and what material and energetic and, energetic and informational inputs it needs in order to optimize that healing process. Especially as, as we get older, we heal slower because we need more. We've accumul accumulated more damage, more deficiencies. And there's a sequence to in which those stresses piled up. And so there's going to be a reverse time sequence called retracing as we dig through the, into the pile. It's like an archaeological dig. So what is retracing? It's time travel. It's traveling back in time energetically into the body's physical accumulation or memory of past traumas, tr stresses, toxins, and damage in order to sequentially reverse and heal those accumulated traumas and damages. And it's also a process of spiritual growth because we cannot do this by cutting out the damaged tissue that just leaves more trauma and more damage. But surgery, by definition, is controlled damage. So healing is not controlled damage. Healing is reversal of damage of whatever kind, controlled or otherwise. So spiritual growth to face the challenges of healing crises, potentially, uh, cleansing reactions. And by facing them and learning how to do so, how to minimize the stress of those and uh, increase the efficiency of healing, we get to accelerate healing 
in order to reverse aging and degeneration of all kinds, with our special focus being on blinding eye diseases, because that's what I faced. That's what I discovered I was facing in my last year of becoming an eye doctor. It's like, oh, I'm going to be blind in my 40s if I don't do this research. So I started doing the research right away. And it, and it has paid off for tens of thousands of other people. So this is an outline of the process of accelerated self-healing in three phases and three steps in each phase, dealing with the past, the accumulated damage, dealing with the present, our understanding of what it is we're facing and, and how then we can monitor that and be aware of the process. It's a dynamic process. Symptoms will change, diagnoses will change as we move through the terrains of health and disease. And uh, and then the future, our future course is dependent on how we treat, how we treat ourselves, how, understanding the different responses to treatment and, and mapping that out so we can understand that we can heal our ability to respond, our uh, response ability, nice pun there. Uh, you can have no response initially, but still be healing because you don't notice any change if, if systems in the body are blocked, but as they become unblocked, there'll begin to be changes in responses. And again, to, to know where you're at on that map is very, very important when we get into that. But, and the power of prognosis, why do so many people actually die when they're told to, when they are told you have six months to live or three months to live? And, and and there's an inordinate number of people who actually carry out that order, that 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 power of suggestion, that self-fulfilling prophecy. And so we want to take that control of our health, including the power of prognosis. The people who I see healing things that are considered irreversible and impossible to heal typically come to me already with a sense that I know I can heal this. And this is not fiction. This is a sense from their spirit, from their future self, who they're becoming, that who already transcendent of time knows beyond a question or a doubt that this is something that they can and will heal. So who am I? Well, you know, there's the the outward story. I went to Dartmouth, you know, taught on his graduate and Another degree in divinity and a couple of doctorates in vision science and natural medicine, fellowships in nutrition and light therapy, Hol international holistic optometrist of the year when I was just three years out of school for the work I did in Japan and the research on reversing cataract and photobiomodulation. This is in the early 1980s before that was even a word <laughs> uh, and other things. So uh, I was... Uh, a contributor to the, the leading, the most used reference work in natural medicine, the integrative body-mind information system. Uh, that's why I was still in naturopathic school and also teaching that. And I was uh, asked to be the author of the vision chapter in alternative medicine, the definitive guide. And with a, a, a good friend who I went to school with, who's also an acupuncturist as well as optometrist, we put together natural eye care and encyclopedia. And many other books and many, many, many other things. But that's an idea of, on, on the outward sense of who I am, but what's maybe more important, more relevant, is my story. I went into optometry to specialize in vision therapy. But in the process, I got diagnosed with glaucoma. I found out that if I followed Western medicine, which was not... <laughs> My interest. I, I would have gone into Western medicine if they had had a specialty in integrative medicine at that time, but uh, they didn't. And I didn't. I'm not a fighter. I, I'm, I'm an explorer. So I wanted to have the freedom to explore nutrition. I knew uh, my father had a, a colleague who was a Princeton graduate who was doing amazing work on nutrition and vision. So in uh, any, any case, this set me on on a path of really doing a deep dive on not just, you know, what is glaucoma? What is the nature of the damage? No, what is the cause? What are the underlying causal uh, pathways and, and factors and, you know, risk factors, but also causal factors? And how can we treat those and remove those causes, as we say in naturop naturopathic medicine, uh, tole causum, remove the cause. And so the, my prognosis was blindness, and, and I was set on a, a 
path of research into the causes. Because I was on that research path, I and only because I was doing that deep dive research for my own, to save my own vision, I found out something that saved my life as well. I would have died of stroke in my 30s had I not been doing that research because what I found in my case, and everybody's different, but there, there are common, common shared factors as well, um, that I was dying of mercury poisoning from dental amalgams. And uh, as a result of being able to treat that, to do the dental work, to remove those amalgams a couple at a time with biological dentistry support, uh, I was able to reverse 35 years of biological age in just three years of, of time. Uh, and I've helped many, many thousands of people to do the same. So... A uh, couple of examples in macular degeneration, which is our first, first public goal, and why I'm reaching out to the public now and to the professions, is to bring the methods and systems and solutions that we've discovered, created, and, and, and formulated uh, to, to the 11 million people who are currently know they're going blind, and another at least 4 million who don't know it yet, uh, and another... 20 million or so who are predicted to be going blind of macular degeneration in the next couple of decades. So it's considered an irreversible cause of blindness, like glaucoma, like some of the other diseases. Unlike cataract, it's treatable but uh, the surgery. But uh, <clears throat> an example of the early results that I saw based on the research I was pulling together on the risk factors, the causal factors, the preventive factors, the nutritional and herbal botanical factors in the medical literature, uh, saw some 35 years ago, the first case of someone who came to me because of the book that, that I'd written. Uh, and she was already legally blind in both eyes. And she wanted to see if I could help her. Um, she she decided not to have laser surgery, which was the only treat, treatment at that time for the bleeding in her retina to cauterize those blood vessels. And she knew that that would do further damage, but with the hopes of minimizing future damage. And then sometimes that works out and sometimes the damage from the laser is actually worse than, than uh, what would have happened in the future from the disease process. So in her case, it's great that she chose that path. And her Harvard-trained retinologist uh, wrote to me when he saw after a few months of accelerated self-healing that he said, I I've never heard of this. I've never seen this before. Uh, to, to, I've never seen it in the literature, heard it from any colleagues or meeting a case like this where she went from being legally blind in both eyes in a few months was able to restore functional vision enough that she could have passed the driver's test. And she's in her upper 80s. She wasn't looking to drive. She didn't need to drive. But she did have on her bucket list a desire to see the South Seas, the islands of the South Pacific. And, and being blind in both eyes, she wasn't able to do that. So she regained enough vision. She actually took a trip by canoe, <laughs> if you can believe that. And she just had the time of her life. She got to see the sites that she dreamed of seeing. Uh, and uh, the retinologist said it, that the, the scar tissue decreased, the bleeding stopped, the vision was restored to a functional level. And uh, again, how can that be? When even still today, 35 years later, the textbooks flat out say about this condition that the damage is irreversible. That just means it's irreversible with what's being used to treat the, the, the knowledge base, the information, the therapies, the uh, ingredients in, in, in natural remedies. Uh, they're just not using anything that's effective, but we've developed and proven effective therapies. Uh, a second key example, uh, another man in his upper 80s who had just lost his driver's license. So his his vision wasn't as far gone as the first woman, 
but he could no longer drive. He was just an otherwise healthy man. He was actually a barn builder. He's a good, strong guy, still moving beams around in his 80s, but he couldn't move the beams because he couldn't drive his truck. So he was frustrated. He found us to another client who referred him to us, said, there's somebody who is helping this kind of challenge. And in one month on our program of accelerated self-healing, he got his driver's license back. So um, and learn more about what we're bringing out to the public at macularegeneration.com. There's the link. There's a, a little illustration of the acupuncture points, the electrodermal testing points around the eye that correspond to different uh, different eye segments, different parts of the eye anatomy. And when when I first started with this process, this is how we tested uh, electro acupuncture testing at the skin, non-invasive, but measuring the uh, impedance of, of the electrical channels and meridians and vessels of the body. Uh, and and in, in a few cases, in rare cases, but in a few cases where we weren't getting uh, the healing process happening just by balancing the overall meridians of the body, 40 measurement points uh, on the hands and feet, then I would resort to actually measuring these points around the eye and, and see if there's something more specific in the eye area that uh, we need to balance. And, and that was very helpful. So uh, EAV, electroacupuncture, according to Vol, foundational, one of the foundational methods. And now we have methods where it doesn't require that a person come to Hawaii to be tested in person electronically. There's many, many different uh, avenues where we can basically communicate with the body energetically, informationally, and to discern where are the stresses, where are the blockages, where, is, where are the challenges, and what do they respond to? What are the remedies that are a match to your body system where your body, it's the intelligence that runs the show. When that intelligence shows that there's a match by a balancing, uh, uh, an increase in coherence in the body field, uh, then healing pr proceeds very rapidly. So how does how does all this experience apply? Well, the vital force is engaged in intelligent, prioritized self-healing. Always, unless there's there's essentially nothing that needs to be healed and the body's in, in just a, sort of an ecstatic, perfect state. I've only ever seen that in one test, and that was uh, a horse. <laughs> it was a prize stallion in a field of grass in the summertime. Uh, with three mares, and I always point out to human males that that, that wouldn't be a stress-free existence for them, but this was as healthy as a horse. Literally no stress patterns. There was no remedy that was needed. The body was in complete coherence. That's when I was being tested by, by my brother's wife at the time, who was a, a medical doctor, rehabilitation specialist uh, who really loved her horses and loved to rehabilitate them, even though she's not a veterinarian. The veterinarian said, this horse, another horse who is badly injured, is just too badly injured. It's never going to heal properly. Put it down. So, um, she knew that I was doing some different kind of work with rehabilitation. She tested me by doing a, a controlled experiment. She sent me samples from two horses, one the labeled A and B, not the name of the horse. And one was the sick horse and one was the healthy horse. And uh, I was able to tell her, oh, this sample here I, is the only time I've ever seen, there is no stress and <laughs> there's no remedy needed. And then the other sick horse, of course, needed a number of remedies and to support healing of its life. So symptoms and diseases are not the causes, they're the effects. They're entropic effects, disharmonic effects of nature deficiencies, the deficiencies of those aspects of nature that are needed in order to complete the healing of those processes. We can identify the causes. They're, they're, they're little, they're, we talk about hidden causes, deeper causes, the underlying causes, the root causes. That's where we need to go in order to Get real healing, core healing. Coherence is measurable with matching remedies, as I was mentioning a minute ago. Syntropy, the opposite of entropy, 
entropy is randomness, disorder, entropy is order, like living things, like crystals, like the universe is, is full of order. But it's hard to harder to measure the order. We can measure disorder because there's heat or there's yeah. So centropy accelerates self-healing, reverses a year of damage in one month on average. And those challenges that are irreversible in all the medical literature start to heal with accelerated self-healing because simply because the body is now healing faster than it's breaking down, faster than it's falling apart, apart faster than it's degenerating, faster than it's aging. You know, in, in, in spontaneous remission of cancer, over 3,000 cases in the med medical literature, most of them are healed in three days with a high fever. And the immune system is healing so fast with that increased metabolism and uh, the, the enzyme activities and even a bacterial infection where the, the microbiome is supplying enzymes that are needed for the healing as well. Uh, so it's a synergistic effect of many of the things that we sometimes see as or interpret in, in modern medicine as part of the problem really are a symptom of or the solution of the immune system and the intelligence of the body in the process of healing itself. And so when we fight against those symptoms, suppress the symptoms, fight against the, the diseases rather than understanding what the cause is and working with the body to heal the cause and get through to a cure, uh, it, it makes all the difference. So I'm going to introduce some food for thought, <laughs> some, some nutrients for your mind. Uh, for those, for, this is designed for deep thinking healers, whether you're a self healer, whether you're a natural healer, like a naturopath, acupuncturist, uh, perhaps a vision therapy optometrist, like how I started out, uh, maybe you're in functional medicine and you're understanding health and healing on a whole different, more dynamic level than here's, you know, there's a book of disease diagnoses that will you know, give you payment from an insurance company. And here's for each of those, the, uh, the drugs that you can legally prescribe, even though they don't make the person healthier, they actually reduce health, but they manipulate and manage the symptoms and it's all legal and they're protected by the systems of government that, that we have that uh, support that, that approach to, to health, so-called disease care. It's not healthcare. So anyway, we're going to talk about time, space, matter, energy, and communication as the fundamental categories. Let's just go ahead and dive right in. So time, uh, body, mind, spirit, and retracing. As I mentioned earlier, the body, uh, as I mentioned, was started out by measuring acupuncture points primarily on the hands and feet, beginning and ends of the meridians and vessels from electroacupuncture, according to Vol, EAV. And so uh, out of that developed BFD, where we work mainly on the control measurement point for each of those vessels, 40 points on the hands and feet. That was one of the primary methods I used. Another primary method was the Vega test, which was developed another 20 years or so later, uh, 1979. All these developed out of German dentists who became medical doctors, acupuncturists, homeopaths, they, they just, like me, interested in the eclectic aspects of, of natural healing. So we use whatever tools and devices and, and whatever leverage we have to uh, to support the healing process and to understand what the dynamics of the body's healing process. So my my first, first energetic client, I, I learned the methods and I was practicing on myself and my family, but the first public client that a, a patient that I invited to, in to, to test, well, she had lost half of her vision, hemianopia in one eye. That's very unusual for a young woman in her 20s. Uh, and so, you know, the standard approach to that in optometry would, well, send them out to the ophthalmologist, you know, send them to neuro-ophthalmologist, send them for, you know, somebody else to do in-depth testing to see what what is it that's happened that stroke or, or you know something blocking, pressing on that nerve, what's going on? There's something pathological going on there. 
So I, I knew I had a tool that that could give me some more subtle, but deeper information. And uh, just very, very curious to see what clues I might get prior to uh, any referrals. And uh, so in the testing, what we saw was an energetic resonance with a no-so to homeopathic vial prepared from diseased tissue, in this case from uh, an invasive ductal breast carcinoma, so breast cancer. Resonance with breast cancer, and it resonated with the left breast specifically. So she had no history of problems or symptoms in the breast, no lumps, no uh, pain, uh, <clears throat> and had never had a, an exam. Uh, so I just, you know, very carefully educated her about what we had found. It was not a diagnosis, but a, but a resonance, an informational signal, a stress response in her, her body to this particular stimulus, the information pattern of a diseased tissue. So, well, it, it, it would just make sense to, to rule it out, uh, you know. And so she went to an oncologist. In fact, they ruled it in. They found exactly the diagnosis of the resonance that we had found. Uh, they wanted to do a radical mastectomy and, you know, invasive treatments. She, she, again, she was a young woman. She wasn't married yet. She wanted to, to get married and have a family. She wanted that kind of future. And uh, so I counseled her to, to seek a second. And then the third, third uh, uh, opinion, since the second opinion came back the same as the first, third opinion, they were totally willing to do a, a, a less, much less invasive lumpectomy and uh, minimally invasive treatment. And she did very well with that. I wound up going to her, her wedding uh, a few years later. So that was my introduction to energetic testing. Uh, it came right at the right time when uh, I was practicing in New York State and was getting remarkable information from ordinary laboratory testing and then computer analysis of the, the, the patterns of those, not just looking at which things the lab says, this is high and this is low. In other words, this individual number is, you know, is, uh, standard deviation from the mean, uh, high or low, or a certain number of standard de deviations away from the mean, um, but rather looking at the patterns of which, which, uh, which sort of syndromes of tests are high and which are low. So patterns of high and low readings that could be maybe 25 or 50% of the population, high, not not you know in the top five percent, uh, and and so well that 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 actually is what got me in trouble <laughs> with the medical profession because I was getting information that they they weren't. Uh, I had a, a my last lab chemistry analysis was a teenage girl had a very very bad focusing problem, uh, visual focusing. And so it was not clearly to me and not in the normal range functionally that would be where, you know, I say, well, this, we should be able to take care of this with high exercises, with vision therapy, which we could do for accommodative focusing problems, no problem. But this was not, this is not normal. This is patholog in a pathological range from my, my professional opinion. And so uh, I was doing lab tests to, to see what we what's the chemistry of her body? What's what's wrong in her body that this is acting so abnormally that, you know, just uh, eye, brain, mind, body exercise wouldn't repair it and restore it. Uh, and so what we found, nothing was, you know, nothing, there was nothing diagnosable directly from the lab tests. Okay, we just have some numbers and some are a little high and some are a little low, but nothing out of range where it's like, oh my goodness, we need to see a medical doctor about this or take a drug for it. But the meta-analysis of the overall patterns showed that she was at extremely high risk for acute pancreatitis. She had no history of pancreatitis. She had no, you know, no known problems in that in that way. Uh, the analysis was able to to point to 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 recommend specific nutritional supplements, which as a teenage girl, she was 
turned out to be unwilling to take. So <laughs> they sat on the shelf and a few months later, she was in the hospital. They diagnosed acute pancreatitis and the mother sort of asked the question to the, the group of doctors when they were review, reviewing the case, she said, well, why didn't any of you pick up on this? You know, she'd seen them for different things before going in the hospital. Dr. Swartout picked up that she was at high risk for acute pancreatitis. Why didn't you? Oh, they didn't like being asked that question. And they also didn't know who Dr. Swartout was because he was an optometrist, not in the same tribe. Uh, and so they basically, I, I never heard from them directly, but they complained to the state that what's an optometrist doing uh, doing these lab tests for? Not, not asking, hey, how can we get this information from lab tests? <laughs> that would have been my thought, my first thought, <laughs> if it was me, like, oh, how do you know that? <laughs> oh, oh, he's sending this lab data off to a computer algorithm in Colorado and, and finding out like more <laughs> than what we're seeing, seeing more deeply into the data. No, so they they just, they looked at the law and the law was not clear. It was a gray area in my license. It didn't say I couldn't order lab tests and lab labs were certain, were perfectly happy to, to work with me as a licensed doctor. Uh, and uh, so they, they their conclusion was, okay, well, it's, it doesn't say you can do these tests, so therefore we're going to rule that optometrists can't, cannot rule, cannot order lab tests. And they also didn't like I was doing some non-invasive tests like trace mineral hair analysis. So they decided in their infinite wisdom that uh, nobody should be doing those tests <laughs> from New York State, and that's still on the books that they, they've Nobody can can order from from the labs that I was working with uh, for the trace mineral testing out of New York State, and that in Connecticut and New Jersey came on board to neighboring states. So sorry about that, people in New York, but it's, I I don't think it's my fault. <laughs> I'm not the one, no patients ever complained. It was only uh, med medical doctors. Anyway. And then we have newer tests also that can be done uh, without, the, these are all done, EAV, BFD, Vega tests done in person, measuring on the body at the acup acupuncture points. But now uh, we can test remotely as a surrogate test. Uh, we can test and you can just apply with us, give us all the information we need, and we can go ahead and do that test. You can do a Nest scan, we'll set you up with a lifetime access to those. You can do anytime you have a change in symptoms or you're about to go to a practitioner, you can do a scan and have immediate access based on a 10 second voice sample, sample with a, a, a 14 page interactive report. It's tremendous. This, this all comes out of research from the Vega test, which came out of the EAV, of German diagnostic electroacupuncture testing. Zyto and other technology that came out of that. And we've developed our own uh, proprietary uh, software on their platform for biofield analysis. And then uh, we're working on, on uh, implementing in another system called Core Energetics from there. Now, as other systems uh, become available and we become aware of them, we'll be integrating with those other ways of testing some require a technical connection like the NEST. You need a, a phone or computer that has internet connection to do that test. The Zyto requires internet and phone connection at the same time. Uh, core Energetics is done remotely. Uh, remote biofield is done remotely without a technical connection because we are all, the universe is connected. There's, there's plenty <laughs> plenty of support for that, which uh, we can talk for days about, but you'll, you'll hear a little bit about here. So the mind, we talked about the body, understanding what's going on in the body. It's the body electric. When, when that book came out, I got people scared about electromagnetic fields that are aware that there's a problem with EMF. And then of course, now we have quadrillions of times more problems with EMF. But even then, it was a significant enough problem. I wrote my first publicly published book, Electromagnetic Pollution Solutions to give people solutions for coming out of European biological medicine. In any case, the mind is 
is a mystery to some degree in science, you know, the, the, the hard problem of consciousness. But the mind is, is a presence in this moment of time. Right? It's a zero-dimensional zero point in time. If we consider the past as a timeline, and the body carries the memory of that and all the incomplete healing that it's carrying. So we're adding to that, either to the healing or to the injury at any given point in time. But, but how do we, how would we know what's going on in the mind? Well, from a, a legal perspective, we'd use a polygraph. We'd measure things like blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and galvanic skin response, the electrical and electrically regulated responses and behaviors of the body can tell us, for example, if the mind is stressed. And so if the person is thinking one thing and, and saying another, that's a stress. So we can use it as, as a lie detector, quote, unquote. Uh, time secret number three would be the future is where the spirit comes from. The, the uh, ancient Egyptians understood this and they had some insights that they were just regaining with modern alchemy. But uh, it's from a future that, while the past is one dimensional, a timeline, the future has multiple possible timelines that we can choose from, and therefore is at least dimensionally two-dimensional. Uh, we are in this life with a one-dimensional past and two-dimensional temporal future on Earth, which is the womb of heaven where all of that time is perhaps integrated into a six dimensional space time in our in fullness of our spiritual sense selves, our transcendental, transdimensional selves. But we're becoming, starting from zero at conception or even whatever comes into the space time continuum in that moment of conception. And we certainly develop materially, develop tissue layers embryologically that we'll talk about when we're born. Uh, now we enter, we go from a world of, of red light and uh, infrared nourishment to full spectrum light and ultraviolet and infrared. Uh, we have, we, we're building this body through a timeline with the movement of the present, which is in physics we call the, the collapse of the wave function and moving into that 2D future or rather the spirit is coming from the future moving moving us forward uh, from that future perspective this is how we can have a vision of the future we can have a premonition we can have uh, insight that's that's true that's trans temporal uh, we can have uh, prophecies, which uh, I myself have experienced in my own life, just personal, uh, personal messages from angels when I was having a, my body was having a seizure, but my mind was having a, a, a full, a fully dimensional experience. Uh, in one case, uh, predicting a couple, a couple of years into the future of the name and state uh, of the person who I eventually marry, and uh, in the other case, a 20-year future prediction about what came true with 9-11 uh, when that happened. And so we can have an out-of-body experience like that, uh, and what is biological death, but the death of the, the bio-body suit, but not the death of the soul, the spirit. It's now having an out-of-body experience and may even regenerate a new body, a new material body, spatial body. So it's, uh, there's, there's, there's a, a growth and development. Our fullness of ourself is in, is in the future. And because it's transcendent, transdimensional, it's also to some degree present here now. I love this quote from centuries ago. St. Thomas Aquinas said, the power of nutrition enables one to exercise the senses, and from sensory experience, the intellect gains concepts, and so the will is free to choose. Interesting point about free will. It's very confusing to the neuro, the neuroscience folks, because when a person makes 
an act of the will, a choice, a free will. The brain has already shown an electrical response a fraction of a second prior to that. Before the experience, before the, the sensory cognitive experience of making a choice, the brain is affected. It's affected in reverse time. Now that's the, the other interpretation. The standard interpretation would be that, well, you didn't really make a choice. You just experienced the feeling of making a choice a fraction of a second after your brain had some electrical effect, phenomenon and your experience is just the epiphenomenon. Uh, we can prove that that's not true, <laughs> that it's actually a reverse, reverse time effect. Um, We'll talk about it in another context of vision, how vision happens in studies on vision, because we see, we see, we project our visual space out into space. Everything that you see is part of your spirit and, and it's pro projected into space. It's not, it's not just happening. The elect electrical phenomena are happening in, in your visual cortex. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's where the neuroscience gets stuck. It's like, oh, the sky is inside the skull. No, that does not explain in any way why you see it out there, why it's projected through a location that we call the cyclopean eye that's somewhere between the two eyes, closer to the dominant eye. When we do vision therapy to get the two eyes working better together as a team, the location of the cyclopean eye moves toward the midline of the body. Uh, and so the, the, the basic studies... Uh, on, on visual perception showed that when they show a slide of something that's uh, a stress, like a fire, a snake, a spider, an injury, car accident, something that creates a sympathetic, autonomic, fight or flight type of response in the body, that response happens before it should, before it can, from a materialistic perspective that only looks at the past and the future doesn't exist yet. It's not real. And uh, it's just whatever we can measure in the past that's determining the future. It's not, not what's happening. What's happening is when they saw this, they, they said maybe the body is somehow picking up on the electrical magnetic field of the computer where the, the, the computer is using a random number generator to a software program, right? To to choose a number randomly that determines what slide is gonna be projected. So nobody, the, the experimenters, nobody knows what, whether it's gonna be a nice pretty picture of a sunset or clouds or you know, a lake, or, or it's gonna be a snake or you know, a broken arm. Uh, and so nobody can, can be affecting it. No, no, no person can be affecting it. They don't have knowledge. So it's a double blind type of study. So then I said, so it must be that, that somehow the body is, is able to sense just at an electromagnetic level, the nervous system is being affected by the field of the computer. So I said, well, we can, we can get a faster computer. And they did. They set up a faster computer to where the computer was so fast that actually what they found was the body is still reacting before the computer selected the random number, right? So the information is traveling in reverse time. That can't happen in a dead universe, only a living sentient, the, the real universe that we are fractal holographic part of, cells in God's body. So, so they went further and, and said, well, where, where, which part of the body is is uh, reacting to it first. Is it the eye? Is it the brain? Is it, you know, the autonomic nervous system? What's the first to react? And they were surprised again that the reaction started in the heart, not in the brain, not in the nervous system, but in the heart. Heart actually has more nerves going to the brain than the brain has going to the heart. That's interesting. Maybe there's some function to that. <laughs> And certainly being able to react to, to something stressful before it appears would be quite useful for survival, wouldn't it? It's very adaptive. So it makes sense that this would function that way if it can. And it obviously can because it does. So, so the heart gets the signal of what's coming. 
it the heart interprets is this a stress is this a threat or not and if it is it alerts the autonomic nervous system through the central nervous system to the body get all before there's light entering the eye of that slide that picture that's being projected on a screen so that's how that's my proof that also the the experience of free will is happening in in the soul as well and it's happening in reverse time affecting the brain as rapidly as possible which means in reverse time is preparing the brain to respond to that choice that's going to be made by the spirit in a moment in the future so so healing is time travel symptoms and diseases are merely incomplete healing processes in the present or from the past Accelerated self-healing supports completion of those incomplete healing processes from carried out over from the past. And a lovely case example is uh, a woman who had a uh, sight-threatening reaction in both eyes, uh, inflammation. Both eyes can, can go blind from this kind of inflammatory reaction. It was a reaction to laser surgery for glaucoma. She had cataracts and glaucoma both of which are often treated with surgical interventions. But now she's had a reaction of sympathetic ophthalmia, which contraindicates any ocular surgery because it could make the surgery itself could make her go blind. Surgery is controlled damage and any damage to the eyes can trigger the sympathetic ophthalmia when you have that tendency. So I worked with her for a number of years. She was in her eighties, retired teacher. Uh, kept her vision from deteriorating, so she didn't need the surge, any of those surgeries, and she couldn't have done it anyway. So we kept her vision going. And uh, one day, I, I, how do we do that? By asking her body what it's trying to heal and supporting it in healing whatever it is that it's trying to heal. So healing the whole body keeps the eyes and the vision and the brain and the body functioning as well as it possibly can. And uh, so she called one day, she was all excited, said, Dr. Glenn, I'm so happy when I go to the dentist tomorrow for the first time, I don't have to take an antibiotic. And you know, she knew from working with me, if she took the antibiotic, now she'd have to take microbiome supplements and you know, at, at a minimum uh, to counteract the negative effects of that. So I said, what, well, why is that? What happened? What's different? She said, well, I don't have a mitral valve prolapse anymore. It's like, oh, oh uh, did, did, did they replace the valves or something? No. <laughs> My Harvard-trained cardiologist told me if he hadn't been my doctor for the last 30 years and was the one who first you know, heard my heart and has been listening to it ever since, diagnosed me with mitral valve prolapse, he would have said with flat out, no question asked that I must have been misdiagnosed because that doesn't heal, but hers did. So how do we know that things can heal? We see it. How do we know, how do the textbooks know and, and claim that things can't heal? Well, they, they haven't seen them heal. When people convert from wet macular degeneration to dry macular degeneration, we'll get just recently got a message through the, the common shared client patient that the, the retinologist was shocked. He was shocked. He looked in her eyes and said, I, I can't believe it. You, you've converted back to dry macular degeneration. The textbooks say that that can't happen. Uh, and, and But you don't need, need to put these needles in your eyes every month now. You know, we'll keep monitoring, see if it holds, but you've taken a step into the area of impossibility in, in, in my world. But if it's possible, and as we've seen it in many cases, so clearly we're doing something different and it takes doing something different to get a different result. Okay. Now we'll get into space, time, space, fundamentals of healing, the dimensions of healing. Consciousness is universal. When you see the stars, you're seeing them. You, your spirit, your mind, your spirit, mind is a function of the spirit, not of the 
body alone, body alone, separate from the spirit. You've got an out of body experience while your body is flatlined and it's dead. Uh, so when you're seeing the stars projected into space, you are projecting them into space. And that's the function of the spirit body and its structure, which is non-ordinary matter. It's spirit minerals is my favorite term for it, but we'll, we'll talk about that. So it's consciousness is universal and it's transdimensional. We had memory in the past. We have vision of the future. And it's connected to the eye and heart, as I mentioned, uh, the eye and, and the heart involved in those studies that show that consciousness is part of the spirit that works in reverse time from the future. It's the future meeting the past. That's what time is, is that movement of that, that meeting. So the eye and the heart are the first visible organs embryologically. And they're the only ones that are so highly energetic that they're linked by all of the electrical channels, so all the meridians of the body. Here's the uh, illustration of the eye and that cyclopean eye that I mentioned, where we see from, we don't see from, light comes into the biological eyes, but we see from this cyclopean eye, a single eye that's located somewhere between the other two. And then the assemblage point is a point in the right thorax that's been pretty well researched. You can see some of the conditions that are uh, uh, noted when that point moves in different directions. I talked about how the cyclopean eye can be offset in, toward the more dominant eye uh, in person with la less than absolutely perfect binocularity, but still with perfect binocularity. So then we have a dominant, a sighting dominant eye and cyclopean eye will be slightly offset to that side just like you have a, a dominant hand or a dominant foot, and you're going to leave with that in, in movement. So, so fascinating, right? If, if that assemblage point that's receiving the, the visual image that's being projected backward in time and interpreting that, if it's down and to the right, far, very far, there could be an indicator of multiple sclerosis, a little less chronic fatigue, a little less clinical depression, a oh, little less anger, neurosis, agitated depression. And different directions, coma way down here to the left, dementia down to the right, not quite as far, delirium, not quite as far down, apathy just down a little bit, and, and upward directions with hallucinations, fantasies, uh, fantasies and apathy, uh, over here, psychotic, manic, panic and anxiety, anxiety and executive stress. So, so the spirit, the, the anatomy and physiology and the chemistry, which we'll get into of the spirit body, is at least as important as that of the bio body suit. It's the two together that, that can heal. But it's the intelligence of the spirit body that actually are in charge, that are guiding, selecting what to heal next, based on your will of choosing what you're trying to do in your life. That will affect it for sure. And your intention and your thoughts and beliefs, it's all, all part of the biofield. So the biofield is universal. Every quantum component of the body, bio, bio body suit, has a field that's theoretically uh, asymptotic to infinity, has potential that extends out from that every electron, every proton, every atom, every compound. And the spirit is transdimensional. There was a study over a century ago that measured the average mass of the soul of human beings, every human that they measured had an instantaneous loss of mass and then a continuing loss of mass over an hour plus or minus. Uh, and so like a comet, like the head of the comet leaving the body with an instantaneous loss of mass. And then the, the, the tentacles, the, the trailers of that comet, the, like the tentacles of an octopus or like an algae for the, the meridian uh, circuits that are programmable, movable, like, like octopus arms, uh, following, leaving the body slowly. It's made of orms, also called, I call them spirit minerals, uh, patented by David Hudson. Uh, these orms, minerals uh, of <clears throat> condensates of the transition mineral group are 
uh, four ninths uh, non-local. Their, their mass of uh, the atom of gold in this state is only five ninths of the mass of a metallic atom of gold. So there's there's a, if you think about atomic energy, the amount of energy in an atom is substantial, and that's the energy that four ninths of the mass of that soul is non-local, is universal, is transdimensional. That's a tremendous amount of energy that your spirit, your consciousness, your being has at its command. And so what you believe, what you think, what you intend, what you choose uh, is all very, very powerful. Our senses are very, very powerful. You, your visual sense has the power to produce that whole world that you see if, that goes away. If you close your eyes, it's you that you're seeing. It's it's it's, it's something to uh, contemplate. <clears throat> so we also know that five percent of the dry weight of the brain is this orm state of rhodium and rhodium. The gold is more in, in the heart center and in the periphery of our, our sensorium or space. It's like our if our spirit is like a uh, a flying saucer, which it is, uh, then the the gold would be in the engine, the, the control center in the heart, and also in the hull of the ship. And the rhodium and rhodium are the, the guidance system in the brain, in the thinking, in the, the vision, the hearing, the thinking, information processing. So uh, space secret number three, I've hinted at the embryological tissue layers. Uh, we can look back to Reckwick, who really brought us into modern homeopathy with complex homeopathy, where you know before that you could really only treat a couple people a day. And if you had a, an epidemic uh, or a big clinic and a lot of sick people, you, you just you couldn't help everybody, but with complex homeopathy. Now you could still treat the individual with a, a, a single homeopathic, uh, but you could also treat the disease state, the symptom pattern with a complex of homeopathics that, that work on that particular disease state or pattern. And uh, we look at, he, he looked at, he laid out the tissues pretty much embryologically. I look at it as embryological tissue layer systems the skin being an integrity system uh, at, off of which the communication system of the neuroendocrine system diverges off of that and, and penetrates back in, in or vaginates into the body, just like the, the processing system of lungs and digestive tract or it forms by an invagination process forming the gut tube, but the neural tube separately invaginates from the skin. And then we have deeper systems of support systems of, of bones and lymph and blood and cardiovascular uh, and connective tissues and the support and the flow for, for movement, uh, movement of the body with muscle and, and movement flow of, of urine, the urinary tract, the urogenital tract. So we can see that there's, there's deeper, when there's deeper penetration of symptoms and disease patterns, it'll go from one of these layers to a deeper layer. And when there's healing, symptoms can clear in a deeper layer and show up in a more superficial layer on their way out of the system. Very important. We also looked at penetration uh, into uh, within the tissue into the cellular, deeper cellular layers. And so we'll, that's a dimension to look at as well. Let's talk about matter, material, substance. It's again, not all it is, and all of it is, all matter is frozen light, according to uh, Einstein's successor as a thinker in, in uh, a deep thinker in phys physics, according to Einstein, maybe David Bohm. All matter is frozen light. So light would be our first state of matter of the 10 that we're going to talk about. The next two are non-ordinary states of matter condensates. Well, in conventional physics, they talk about Bose-Einstein condensates. Bose and Einstein uh, both predicted that the state might exist, could exist, should exist. They thought it, they could think of it. 
they could contemplate it. And not till the 1990s was the research that documented it. Yes. So we bring the temperature down to absolute zero, or close enough to zero degrees Kelvin, that we remove all of this, the, the, the entropy, the, the heat energy, the randomness. And then now all the atoms have the same energy, identical energy level. They're no longer quantized as separate atoms, but function as a field. And that field can be in the same space as quantized matter without displacing the quantized matter because it's not taking up space. It's in space, but it's it's not of it, <laughs> let's say. Uh, like the spirit is in the world, but not of it. It's this non-ordinary matter. So that won the 2001 Nobel Prize. And prior to that, David Hudson already had his patent for orms that are partially, partially, I, I consider them condensates. So they're, they're partially condensed, partially non-local. Uh, and so four ninths of the mass is non-local in these transition elements, about a dozen of them that he identified and three primary ones in, in the spirit body, but they're probably all 12 have some function. <clears throat> so uh, we've already mentioned 5% of the dry weight of the brain is rhodium and iridium. Super, they have functions that are different. They're non-ordinary, different than other matter. And so they're superfluid. So they can occupy the same space as ordinary matter without displacing it. In other words, the spirit can be in the body. When it, it can move out of the body, we can have an out-of-body experience. We can move in the body. It doesn't, nothing of the material by a body suit has to move for it to come into the body or move out of the body. It goes right through it. Ghostly, let's say. It's superconducting. That's that's uh, powerful. It produces Meissner fields that that prevent it from taking on the energy of fields around it, like the, the, the temperature of the body. It's not, it's not thermally, uh, it's not thermally linked to the body, not thermally coupled. So, you know, in conventional thinking, the conventional thinking would be, oh, you can't have condensates in the body because it's too warm and wet. It's, you know, it's, it, they, 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 they come to a thermal equilibrium by taking on heat from the body and therefore they, very quickly become solid, liquid, you know, these other states. No, they're not thermally coupled. They prevent those external fields from affecting the internal field. They're protected, they're shielded. And the field is about five times larger than the field, than the functional field of the same atom in a metallic state, whether it's gold, rhodium, iridium. So these huge fields, they can be in the material biological substance, and, and bring in consciousness, bring in this function of trans-dimensional connection, connectivity of information and meaning uh, and, and interconnectedness, integral, integral connection within the soul, which again is universal So uh, and, and trans-temporal. Uh, and they carry energy as phonons. So photons, light, light becomes a form of sound, a phonon movement at the speed of sound within the spirit body. And that's how the spirit body can carry all an entire lifetime of, of memory and thought. It doesn't degrade. There's no resistance to the flow of these phonons within the superconductive field. So it's immortal. It doesn't lose energy. It doesn't take energy to continue. And, and these minerals tend to form two-dimensional crystals. Oh, that's kind of like computers? <laughs> yeah, kind of like computers. So kind of like cell membranes. Oh yeah, kind of like cell membranes. Yeah. Uh, so kind of like the layers of, when we talk in a moment about uh, structured water, the layers of pi electrons in the cell membrane are in the structured water. Yes, very much so. So consciousness can come into play there. Um, this is just a little map of chakras and meridians, a uh, possible relationship between uh, the chakras, looking at the chakras as concentric spheres, as, as uh, the vortices at the top and bottom of, of those spheres surrounding the heart, which has the strongest electromagnetic field in the body, can measure 20 feet away. 
And so the throat and the solar plexus chakra would be at the top and bottom of the sphere. So you'd have the heart, chakra four, fire element, heart. The, the meridians are all four of these are classical acupuncture meridians, small intestine, heart, endocrine, or classically called triple warmer or triple heater, and circulation classically called the heart detector. All of the other chakras have, as the best I can map it out, and this needs more research, but the best I can map it out, uh, again, it's a proposed theory, <clears throat> is uh, two meridians or two vessels. Some of them are electro electrodermal vessels mapped out, uh, the point, all each point mapped out by Vol in the 1950s, by at least three clinical cases documenting an abnormal impedance or electrical reading at that point, and an abnormal uh, structure uh, pathology at the same part of the body internally. So it's a fractal holographic representation of the internal body on the surface of the body. But the heart is unique. It's the center. It's the core. It's the engine. Uh, it's the guidance system. So there's solid matter. We all learned about solid matter in school. Right? Oh, like, you mean like glass? No, glass actually is a super cold liquid, but good guess. Uh, that's why old window glass is thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. It's actually flowing very, very slowly, but it's it's a liquid. So that same silicon dioxide, when it is a solid, is quartz. It has very different properties. Glass uh, is not clear to ultraviolet radiation, but quartz is. Oh, interesting. And quartz is piezoelectric. That's why you have quartz watches. Uh, but what else is piezoelectric? Connective tissue is. Even bones are. The, 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 the mineral structure of bone is not piezoelectric, but somehow the overall structure of bone does have a property of piezoelectricity, which means sound is transduced into electromagnetism and vice versa. It's like the spirit body transduces electromagnetism, light, into sound phonons. Our connective tissue make matrix actually acts as a fiber optic network for biophotons, which are coherent laser-like signals, primarily in the blue and ultraviolet frequency ranges. And another area where the, the conventional thinking was, well, we can't have biocommunication with light because it's too warm and wet, there's too much noise. No, because they're laser-like, they're coherent, it totally works. And then here's, we'll show you, here's how the mitochondria move, you can see them moving in both directions, they you know where they're going, versus here in a low energy terrain where we have viral degenerative cancerous types of changes, Oh, there's no energy. Yeah, exactly. So the to heal these things, you don't kill the cancer. You don't kill the or cut out the degenerative tissue. You don't kill the virus. You re-energize the function, you restore the function. So mitochondria are actually built like lasers, with the sections going partway across and then going partway across the other direction. They're built just like little lasers, and here they are moving along the microtubules, connective tissue inside the cells. It's connected to the connective tissue outside the cells, fiber optic network of the body. Fun stuff. So then there's liquid, right? There's just water is water. No, water isn't just water. There's bulk liquid. It's a sol, a, a water. And there's liquid crystal or gelatinous water. Why do you think a water strider can walk across, or some lizards even, can walk across the top of water? If it was bulk liquid, they couldn't. But there's a layer of structured water, liquid crystal water, on the surface that well, has entirely different properties. The chemistry is different. It's not H2O. It's what I call living water, is H3O2 minus, and the Many, 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 and stands for a, a, a variable number, millions and millions and millions of these units, just like it makes up ice. 
but in in the water, the the layers are are uh, a little closer together and and, and offset. Uh, in, in ice, the further apart, uh, try ice slopes. Good thing. Uh, <clears throat> so this living water, liquid crystal water, has ten times the penetration of other filtered waters, other pure clean waters. Brings in nutrients, brings out toxins ten times better. So it's significant uh, healing modality that we want everyone to understand. It's one of only two therapies that can actually prevent amputations that are scheduled. You know, a person has gangrene, their leg is dying, it's almost dead, it's got to be cut off before it kills the rest of the body. It can be scheduled for a week or two away. And this is one of only two therapies. You will stick around and learn about the other as well. But uh, it, that's incredibly powerful. There's no nothing else that, that can do this. Uh, an example case study from my experience was a friend who's a nutritionist, a partner of a naturopath who I went to school with. Um, she's type 1 diabetic, and her insulin was not working. She's a nutritionist. She counsels people. She knew she should drink water, right? But she couldn't force herself to drink water, whatever kind of water, bottled water. She had her own health food store. She could try every brand. There was nothing that her body could, she could force her body to take in. The day that we, that she started using the ionizer uh, for alkaline ionized water that we sent to her was the day her insulin started working. Her sugar levels came down from 300s down to close, close to normal. Uh, she could take the insulin, but it didn't change the blood sugar levels. We know from research that one insulin molecule can trigger eight insulin receptors at the same time. But that's only if it has this structured liquid crystal water on, on the cell membrane that then transmits that signal. Now it's like a infrared remote control garage door opener for those, for those uh, insulin receptors. Versus if that water is not there, if it's just regular bulk water with whatever in it that's in it, toxins and wastes and nutrients and viruses and full of whatever's there, now the insulin molecule has to find its way to that one insulin receptor and it works as a lock and key, which is the model that we've all been taught in the past. Uh, didn't mean to move on quite yet, but uh, so we have, just wanna show you a little bit here. So, so alkaline ionized water has a negative electrical charge. That means it has electrons. It has electrons, a negative ORP or by RH2, molecular hydrogen water, it's another term for that, uh, versus often what's promoted for clean, healthy water would be dead distilled water, the H of zero of seven and <clears throat> RH2 of zero, uh, zero electrons, no negative ORP if you're using an ORP meter. And in fact, a lot of people drink tap water, which would be usually chlorinated, fluoridated. Those are oxidizing agents. Those are going to age and damage the body. This illustration here shows how much water is actually on Earth. It was all in little spheres. There's the salt water. There's the fresh water. There's the potable water. And the living water would be too small to see. <laughs> okay. Gas. Well, we breathe in gas, right? And breath and spirit mean the same thing. So we breathe in spirit. Do we breathe in the spirit minerals that make up the soul, the nutrients that form our immortal body, our sentient body? Well, let's take a look. Oxygen is paramagnetic. We know that. The spirit minerals, uh, spirit mineral condensates are also paramagnetic in the air, in the Earth's atmosphere, para, parallel to the Earth's magnetic field. They become diamagnetic 
in living creatures because, because they become parallel to the magnetic field of the creature that they're now part of. And that happens in the heart, which has a strong enough electromagnetic field to change those spirit minerals from earth-oriented to you-oriented, to being part of you. And in that moment, in that, that, that heartbeat, <clears throat> those new spirit minerals that are now part of you are carrying that that uh, sentience of that moment, that gestalt, that from the stars that you see in the heavens to the emotions you feel in your body, all, all of that information is embedded in that one heartbeat and now part of your immortal soul. So that's how we look at the why, the deeper understanding of why spirit and breath are one and the same. And that's the beginning of the consciousness cycle, which we'll we'll talk about that too. But we we breathe it in, and and we make it ours. Uh, create the relationship, the meaning, the relationship to it in the heart. So there's also higher energy states called plasma, which is really three different states: dark mode of plasma, like in biological systems, we call it blood plasma. We call it cytoplasm. In fact, the plasma of physics in the cosmos, or like here, the double layers we see here on a cathode, uh, that's named after the biological plasma because it moves like biological systems because biological systems work on biological plasma and that's how they move. And these double layers that you see are alternate layers of of concentration of ordinary matter, of ions, and rarefaction. So there's like vacuum areas. Oh, well, those are the areas where the spirit minerals will be concentrated. You can't see those, but they're there. And they're there in, in the body in these layers as well. All, all, all plasma shows these double layers set. It's fractal. It's at every layer of the cosmos. This is glow mode, what you're seeing here. An arc mode would be like a spark or a, a lightning bolt, a dark discharge. You can see the, the way that it functions is one particular curve, and there's a discrete discontinuity that goes into a glow discharge mode and another discrete discontinuity into arc discharge mode. So these are different functions. It's like normal biology. We've got this dark discharge going on the body when the body's alive there's energy moving there's electricity moving uh electricity moving from the ekg through the blood vessels is is essential for fully half of the blood flow in entering the organs so if that's blocked by emf in the environment we can lose our our wellness and now we're susceptible to disease the glow discharge an example would be uh certainly uh, when you see a halo around the head of a saint, when people have seen this, that's literally a higher energy state of the plasma in the body. It's now putting off a glow discharge. The arc discharge, uh, I, I believe <clears throat> if we look into that, we'd, we'd see that happening at the moment of conception. It's the most powerful energy discharge, enough to fry the cell membrane of the egg, right? You're frying that egg to separate it now, to shut off all those ion channels, separate it, isolate it from the, the mother, and you have a new spirit, a separate entity, a separate soul within that now fertilized egg. Uh, and, and mothers experience that moment, they can feel it, and they can feel the presence of another being. So it's just to, we're not set, we're not so different and separate from the universe that we're part of, and it is a living universe. Matter secret number two, uh, we need to elevate our treatments to as high, uh, the upper half of the numbers here. So avoiding surgery, it's controlled damage. And so there's times when, when it is life-saving or site-saving. So we're not philosophically opposed to the lower levels of treatment, but we are philosophically dedicated to the prevention of the need for that and the healing of the damage that is part of the side effect of that. 
suppression by drugs, uh, we know are a leading cause, probably the leading underlying cause of death, but the lead, second or third, according to the study, uh, leading direct cause of death. Uh, and so it just it illustrates that they're very damaging. They, they work by blocking pathways rather than stimulating or supporting healing. And so we want to minimize that. And the safest way to take a drug is the way the Native Americans would carry a medicine pouch, put one tablet or capsule in that pouch. It's now in your body field. You're getting the light from it, the light information, and that can be often as effective as the material substance, which has the toxic side effects. So try that. And uh, substitution, at according to the law of dosage effect, if you have a high dosage, that can become suppressive. So the smaller doses of substitution therapies like hormones or digestive enzymes, where we're not signaling the body that, it, that we're giving it everything it needs, it doesn't have to work anymore, but we're giving it a little bit, a little nudge in that direction, but it still needs to participate in the production of those enzymes or hormones. That would be a low-level substitution therapy that, that could be viable as a, a long-term and, and truly healing support system. Uh, support would be nourishment, for example, uh, and stimulation. Uh, herbal therapy that stimulate like bitters, adding bitters to the gastrointestinal support to stimulate the production of gastric juices. Now, that prevents the body from becoming dependent on the hydrochloric acid that you're substituting at the same time. Uh, homeopathy is certainly stimulatory. And in his studies on provings, mostly with uh, doctors and nurses who were healthy, but they'd take a homeopathic, the same homeopathic consistently until they'd start to experience the symptoms triggered by an excess of that. They actually noted that those who did that actually improved their health. So they were stimulating cleansing pathways. Uh, like a study with rats and arsenic, they found the rats excreted about uh, a third of the arsenic that they were exposed to and the other two thirds of stored in the tissues. And they're exposed to a homeopathic of arsenic, non-toxic uh, informational dose of biocommunication. Body gets a signal, oh, there's arsenic in my field, in my environment, I better clean out some of the arsenic that I have stored in case more comes in, then they clean out another third of that half of the stored toxin. Then we have uh, energy secrets, the terrains. If we want to uh, diagnose uh, a bacteria or a fungus, we can't put our tissue, our sample uh, in, in the same petri dish and expect to grow bacteria and or fungus. We need a fungal medium of dead matter, carbohydrates for the, the fungus to grow on, or, or we need uh, some protein that the, that the uh, bacteria or maybe parasites can, can grow on, a different petri dish, different terrain, different conditions, different growth medium. And the same is the case in the body. So we look at the growth media of symptoms and diseases as an underlying cause, as a primary vector of primary dimension of healing. Low energy terrain where there's no structured water on the cell membrane is the only terrain where a virus can actually be magnetically attracted to the cell membrane so it can go in and reproduce. And we can look at that as uh, not necessarily uh, a pathogen, but it can be since about 7% of our own DNA is viral DNA or exosome D DNA, right? production of taking that toxic DNA and reproducing more copies of it and excreting that may be our pathway to excrete uh, and detoxify heavy metals that are attracted to the deeper layers, the genetic layers in the cell. So we go from balance, stress brings us into a cleansing, mode or toxicity or allergy symptoms, heart attacks, various symptoms to into degenerating into an uh, area where we need to regenerate tissue, but if we don't have the, enough energy and enough clear space, we can't regenerate. And that can degenerate into penetration inside the cell through the cell membrane uh, to where 
our own enzymes aren't working enough to break down the the uh, substances like proteins that can now become food for bacteria and parasites. And we have rapid aging, oxidation uh, into low energy states where viruses and and uh, viruses uh, and and this. Uh, um, the other, what was the other term? <laughs> Viruses versus the uh, exosomes, exosome theory. There, there's actually no research that proves that viruses are living things or that they are uh, an, an infectious agent. In any case, uh, <clears throat> into uh, degenerative terrain and, and, and even to cancerous terrain where the cell is now a blind cell, it can't see what tissue it's in and what sort of cell to form, and it's just storing storing up waste products, lactic acid, and succinic acid, and other toxins, until we can get enough oxygen, nutrients, light in there to clean it out, to finish the, the healing process. They're getting 80 to 90% cure, five-year survival with cure of cancer without any uh, any treatments that are known to be carcinogenic that would include surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Another view of the terrain, which we've already talked through. And um, <clears throat> energy secret number two, well, frequency is a dimension. It's the energy dimension, just as the terrain is in an energy dimension of the tissue. This is an energy dimension at the, at the quantum level. Uh, frequencies are, and wavelengths are an equivalence. So we can look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you know, we could even go further here into uh, into uh, sound waves, which I mentioned sound waves convert in the body into electromagnetic waves and vice versa because the body tissues have piezoelectric qualities with the connective tissue. So we have a frequency spectrum. We can see one octave of that. So picture in a keyboard, a piano keyboard that's 88 octaves long, maybe more, but at least that. Very, very important ultra infrared and ultraviolet, very important in physiology as well, even though we don't see them directly. Occasionally we'll see infrared. When you see a green flash at sunset, you're actually seeing the infrared image of the sun. It hasn't quite passed over the horizon as quick as the, the red light did. <clears throat> then uh, here's an infrared image. So this is what our natural environment looks like in infrared. If it's a green environment that's conducive to a good place to live, it's heavenly. It's look how bright it is in infrared. And that's actually the energy that that the the couple to the two cases of breatharianism that have been documented, one in India, one in Texas, in medical clinics studying for weeks. Yes, indeed, these people are metabolizing light from their environment. Infrared light is being used as the source of energy that runs the metabolism. They don't have to eat. We can get enough water from our environment from breathing and recycling urine. They've measured the bladder filling up and then getting uh, decreasing as the body reabsorbs the, the fluid. And you know, if we're metabolizing light, there is no waste product. There is no carbon dioxide that needs to be uh, breathed out as uh, an, an excretion product, there's no uh, no excess acidity form that needs to be um, to come out with the sweat, the urine, the, the feces. Body eliminates acids, it keeps the alkaline inside our bones uh, store with alkalinity. So here's a, a, a sort of a symbolic of every chemical reaction that happens in the body. If it were an endothermic reaction, an anabolic building up of proteins or something like that, uh, it would the the products would be at a higher energy level rather than a lower energy level. But otherwise, everything the same. Every reaction 
has a certain activation energy that's that's required, a certain Gibbs free energy plus or minus that's the, the overall effect. But we're particularly interested in this activation complex that needs to form to have, sorry about that, to, uh, to have that reaction go on. We need that energy plus the reactants. And if there is no enzyme, which is an amplifier, uh, then we are going to have a slower reaction or we're going to need more energy. Uh, so an enzyme is an amplifier and uh, ATP, the what we're taught about in school as the energy source, that's a battery. A cellular battery comes from the mitochondria. But we can run that through another cellular battery, which is the living water in the cell, only dependent on the volume of living water that's in direct contact with the enzyme or with the reactants. So uh, this is how we can live on light. Uh, this is how other species, all the species could live on light alone uh, and the lion lies down with the lamb uh, in geological history and in geological future history would happen again when the earth is inside the photosphere of a red, a red dwarf star, which uh, is a different state of, of uh, energetic state of, uh, for example, Saturn and, and, and uh, um, Saturn and Jupiter both could be red dwarf stars in other, other energetic states uh, of our local universe. And uh, apparently that has been in, in the past, the case. It, within the human history, not, not written history, clearly, but within uh, human, even human cultural history, apparently. There's remnants of it in the linguistics around the planet. And we have uh, a few more slides. This is Ravici's look at what I was saying about how the heavy metals further down on the chart here have an affinity for deeper into the nucleus and the DNA of, of the cell. And so that's how exosomes, viruses can be our way of cleansing the body of those heavy metals. And when we look at it in that way and support the body and healing it that way, we get people who've had, you know, 20, 30 years of, of herpes outbreaks. All of a sudden, now their body is able to cleanse so much more efficiently, it doesn't actually need to form those immune reaction vesicles and all the symptoms. And we're getting the cells healthier faster and the symptoms clearing that otherwise they were stuck in, in this sort of disease mode of, of trying to heal, but having a challenge doing it. Communication, our last big topic. Secret number one, information is entropy. And that's like noise, that's disease, measurable as temperature, heat, okay? Uh, now the body will use that heat for good, for healing, uh, when we have a fever, it's not the bacteria that causes or virus that causes a fever, it's the immune system that causes it in response to the overall uh, conditions in the terrain. And it uses that to increase the metabolism, the effective rate of activity of the immune system to get the job done faster. So rather than suppressing a fever, we want to support the immune system to get the job done and understand what's the deeper job that it's working on. You can see the light coming from our cities. Uh, you measure the EMF in the ionosphere above where this electrical grid is happening. And if we ask people to spontaneously make a tone, they'll spontaneously make a, a 60 Hertz tone. Uh, many people beyond statistical, beyond random in, in an area like the United States, an area where they use 50 Hertz uh, mains power in Europe will will make that tone. So these are some disharmonic frequencies. There's there's harmonic frequencies like 172 hertz that we discovered in our own research, and then discovered that it had been known thousands of years ago 
uh, as the dominant harmonic frequency of nature. I should probably add a slide about that, but I uh, already mentioned about the 50% of the blood flow can be blocked by a little bit of EMF. Learned that from PhD researchers from Taiwan uh, here at a conference in Hawaii. And you know what, when they discovered that, because that was not good information, you know, for uh, legal reasons for the electrical utility, which is a big business, uh, they lost their research funding and they weren't able to publish it, but they were able to tell us uh, clinicians about it. So been learning for a long time about how energy works, electromagnetic resistance solutions. Not my first book, but the first one that I published publicly uh, you know, to Amazon and all, put it on Amazon. And, but uh, other books on blinding eye diseases and health have been doing privately for a long time. And then in 2012, I put out a whole a bunch of them. Some project. Need to do some more. Here's uh, another communication secret. And this is the second therapy that reverses uh, a blackened limb that's about to be cut off, about to kill the person if it's not. And you can see before the treatment, how the blood is flowing, but slowly, and how much faster it's flowing after about 15 minutes on a, a P, PEMF mat, either the beamer or the cloud, I recommend the cloud, it's less expensive. It's the same research, line of research, same people developed it, but less expensive and, and more effective because it covers the full frequency range of, of uh, audio frequencies up to 20,000 Hertz. That increase of 30% circulation, 31% for lymph circulation, according to the research on the Beamer, <clears throat> is equivalent to about 40 years of age reversal on circulation. And if you do this twice a day, you're sustaining that. There is no other way to do this. And again, only this and the alkaline ionized water are therapies that independently are powerful, each powerful enough to prevent amputation of a gangrenous limb. I would do both if I was about to have a limb cut off. <laughs> so uh, we have the Nest system, 10 second vocal scan. We'll give you free lifetime access to this. In 10 seconds, you'll have each of these tabs here will be another page. This one says stars. Those are the body systems from immune lymph system, memory imprinter, so cognition and heart, heart that heart uh, imprinting of the consciousness into the, the spirit with each beat of the heart, the nervous system, triple cavity, that's an ancient term. We now call it uh, endocrine for modern term terms, auto autoimmune system, circulation, muscles, chill, so the, sort of the fight or flight, re relaxation, autonomic system, audio, so hearing, a speech language, vision, video, they call it, this out of England from a, a doctor, a researcher from, from Australia, started the acupuncture school there and was trained in England. And one of his patients who got from being bedridden to being able to function, created the technology based on his 30 years of research at the Vegas Test Method. Carbohydrate metabolism, male or female, depending, it'll be you know, the appropriate for your uh, information. And, cell metabolism, heavy metal detox. It's, it's so comprehensive. And there's it's not just the diagnostics of it that are so essential, so helpful for any of your therapists to do this scan you know, within a day or so before you go in for a visit and be able to share that with them, what's going on energetically, informationally, functionally within your body, what your body's trying to heal, these purple ones. Okay, there's something going on with the, the heart or memory, what's going on there? And you can click on that and it'll give you a whole page or just mouse over, it'll give you a description of what that is all about. So you can look into it at deeper and deeper levels. Uh, like here, it's highlighted on the heavy metals and it's showing the description, showing organs that relate to that. There's also remedies. And if you can drink water, you can put drops, these drops in your water once a day, typically for about a month or so. And uh, incredible healing effects. This is epigenetic healing. It's it's changing the field. It's changing the information. They call these infoceuticals, information medicine. 
and uh, studies tissue studies. So, you know, there's no placebo effect. Tissue studies at UCSD in San Diego, University of California, are showing, beginning to study the, each of these uh, and seeing the different effects that they have on the cell tissue culture. Uh, one that works with cell metabolism, it's doubling the number of mitochondria inside each cell within a couple of days, two, three days. It's remarkable. They're obviously now half the size, but twice the number, and those will grow into full-size mitochondria. That will take a little bit longer time, but the, the mitochondrial biogenesis effect is uh, imme virtually immediate, so within a couple of days. Or uh, another case, reducing reactive ox oxygen species in the cells. Another case, reducing viral penetration of the cells. So again, specific effects. These are just the one, a few of the ones. These are the ones that are uh, are recommended for use, even just based on symptoms. You don't necessarily have to have the scan information. And by the way, you can scan animals as well. It's amazing uh, that these you can use based on symptoms or the, they'll show you which ones to use based on the scan, if you do a scan. And all the others for meridians and organs and trains, et cetera, are all specific to the scan. Communication secret number three. Well, how about where are you in terms of regulation? How does your body respond? When you give it what it needs, how well does it heal? You know, the first point is to make sure that, that you're actually taking the right things, doing the right therapies, getting the right support in order to experience accelerated self-healing. But if you have blocked regulation, you're still not going to experience a whole lot. It's going to take time to unblock, and you still need to keep doing the right thing. So you need good guidance in order to, to heal the regulation when it's in a low state. This would be, you know, you have a client who says, oh, I've tried that. I tried natural medicine. It didn't work. It doesn't work for me. Okay, well, it's not because natural medicine doesn't work. It's because your body's not working. It's not able to respond. And you may have even been taking the right things. If you had a good practitioner, you probably were taking some things that were right on target. And if you stuck with it long enough with the right guidance, <clears throat> you'll start to cleanse. And you might feel worse before you feel better with negative regulation. And then some things will start to improve, even while other things are still getting worse. Oh, uh, I don't have asthma anymore, but that rash that I had before I had the asthma is coming out on my skin again. Oh, because I'm retracing the toxins are coming out of a more superficial layer. They're coming out of the deeper or crucial layers for, for health and survival. And finally, we get into positive and optimum regulation where you just do the right thing and you feel better and things work better. And it's, it's all uphill from there. A lot easier to self-regulate your self-healing at that point because you could feel you try something. Oh, that feels good. Hey, exercise feels good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep doing this particular exercise every day for a while. <laughs> Where if you're really jammed up and stuck, you think you're gonna feel better right away if you, you know, go to the gym, get a gym membership and work out. Well, at best you might feel worse before you feel better, right? Same with uh, improving your diet. You might feel worse before you feel better. So you need good guidance. Uh, these are just a, a few of my favorite stories and case studies. I'm not going to go into those right now, but uh, lots of, of fun and interesting and fascinating and mind-blowing experiences that have led me to, to think along with all these lines. So what questions are you asking? I, I, I share uh, many, not someday maybe all of my mentors, but many dozens of my mentors that I've learned from both living and and who came long before me, some of them, uh, at mentorshipu.com. Uh, there's no fee or anything. You're welcome, very, very welcome to visit there. And um, I should put a link to our community as well, because you're welcome to visit there as well. And we have free courses and the free interactive question and answer, uh, weekly uh, open office hours. Again, no charge. It's open free lifetime membership. Same with, with uh, I mentioned the Nest access to the Nest system, which typically you'd, you'd pay for each scan with your practitioner. We're offering that to you for free, free lifetime access because you know we can't possibly help and guide individually everybody who needs it or wants it, but we can help everyone by making the access to the information as freely available as possible. 
And similar with, I've got over 50 websites. These are just a couple of them that are, are, are key, especially if you're a practitioner, clinicaltheory.com, clinicalpraxis.com, where I organize a lot of this information uh, in, in more of a, a, a clinical approach to it. Um, so accelerate self-healing. You can do it. And we know how. We've created over 150 functional formulations in the past 10 years out of this limitation of what was on the market and needing solutions for real solutions for real clients and digging into the research and formulating the most complex, comprehensive, clean uh, uh, formulations that uh, I know of and uh, Love to share them with you. You can look at the formulations, free access to the information at remedymatch.com. And uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. There'll be more. <laughs> There's always more. Uh, so let me know your questions and challenges and love to put our heads together to uh, come up with solutions. Transformational solutions. That's the name of the game. That's the name of one of my websites too. Okay. <laughs> Aloha and uh, look forward to speaking soon.